Good evening, students. Today we will be discussing the early industry um, in the United States. If you would please take notes on the following items. Um, turn the following terms into your guiding questions for your Cornell notes. Industrial Revolution's origins, the factory system and urbanization, uh, transportation and technology. These will be the items that we will focus on during the lecture. Thank you. Once again this evening, we will be discussing early industry in the United States and the inventions that followed along with it. We will be discussing the inventions more in depth tomorrow in class. If you live in a country that wishes to be industrialized, there are certain things that every industrial country has to have, and these are called the factors of production. Um, factories that would open in the United States would open first in small towns, and eventually cities would grow around them um, because they would have these particular things. First off is land. Land is essentially enough area or space to accommodate a factory, Secondly is labor. Uh, labor is people who are going to work at that factory. Sometimes these laborers need to be taken from other places to brought to the area where the factory is and maybe will live in the area where the factory is. And thirdly is capital. Capital in this case stands for money. Um, money and natural resources. So for instance, um, capital can be a small business loan from a, uh, a bank, or it could be the fact that there is a river um, or any other natural resources that will benefit that particular area. Capital also includes machinery and different technology that is used in the manufacturing of particular items. Now, oftentimes, industry is spurred on by innovation, and innovation is spurred on by individuals and things that they invent. So, for instance, uh, the Samuel Slater uh, mill, the spinning jenny, which would spin uh, raw materials in the thread, John Deere and his plows, Robert Fulton and his uh, steamboat, Eli Whitney in the co cotton gin and interchangeable parts for guns, and Samuel Morris with arguably the most important of all, the um, telegraph. The inventions and innovation that these men would create would spur on the Industrial Revolution and the factory system. Now, if you remember, under Thomas Jefferson's democracy, he did not want industrialization to happen. However, industrialization was going to happen because it was happening throughout the world. So how did it happen, and where did it happen, and where did it begin in the United States are questions that we will be answering right now. Industrialization began in England um, in terms of the modern-day industrial revolution that we would think of. It started with British inventors um, making machines to create textiles quicker and more efficiently. Now, the British had all of the factors of production. They had the land, um, even though it was not as great as the United States. They had labor. They had a large underclass of people that needed jobs. And most importantly, they had capital. They had a lot of bank um, money from all of their trading throughout the world. Although industrialization would start in England, one Samuel Slater would memorize um, the plans of the mechanized looms and bring them over to the United States where he would set up his own factory in the state of Rhode Island in 1790. This would begin the Industrial Revolution. Now the Industrial Revolution, as I said, began in the late 18th century in England. Um, basically what an Industrial Revolution is is when hand tools and individual work is replaced by factories um, and machines and farming is replaced by large-scale uh, farming equipment. Um, essentially your clothing, everything that we know and love and is dear to us today has been created in a factory somewhere throughout the world um, and that is why we are able to afford things like a $12 t-shirt. The Industrial Revolution in the United States would begin with the textile industry or the clothing industry. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, clothes were made at home by hand. This was exceedingly expensive. During and after the Industrial Revolution, clothes would be made in factories using machines. This would make it 
possible to make more clothes quicker, driving the cost down. Often these machines would be run by children. This was before child labor laws would make that illegal. Inventions such as a spinning jenny and the power loom would make old uh, needles and threads obsolete and would make the uh, production of clothing much quicker. New inventions such as the spinning jenny and the power loom spurred on the creation of the factory system. A factory system would be the opening up of factories where manufactured goods would be made. Many people would come from all around the country um, and leave their farms to move to cities to work at these factories. Instead of employing one or two people on a couple of acres, they would employ hundreds of people on a couple of acres. They wanted money that factories paid that was significantly greater than money paid out on farms. This change, however, was not always for the better. The first place to have multiple factories in the United States was New England. New England was a good place for factories because it had land, labor, and capital. Factories needed water power, and New England had many fast-moving rivers in order to power the machinery. In this diagram, you can see how the water from the river would power a water wheel, which would in turn power a pulley system, which would bring power to the various machines on many levels of the factory. Each machine would be operated by one woman most likely um, and so therefore you had one machine doing the work of multiple people and one person handling that machine. The most famous of all of the factory owners was Francis Cabot Lowell. Um, Lowell built his first factories in eastern Massachusetts on the Concord River. The factory would spin cotton into yarn and then weave that yarn into cloth. Um, something that was different about his factory was that he mainly uh, hired women. The Lowell girls, as they would become known, lived in a company boarding house where they would work 12 hours a day um, in deafening noise. Essentially, they were owned by Lowell and they were treated more or less as uh, indentured servants rather than um, independent workers. These girls would come from all throughout the countryside. They came for a number of reasons. Number one, to escape the drudgery of farm life. Number two, uh, that there was good pay uh, that's to be made there, about $4 a week. And uh, it was something good and positive to do while they were young. Most of them were able to support their farms back home with the money that they were able to make uh, creating textiles. This was a young woman's game, and most often the Lowell girls would leave after they were married, and they would only work for a few years. While life in the mills for most women was an escape from the drudgery of a life on a farm, they did work extremely hard and for oftentimes half as much as men. For example, in your average mill, in your average work week, which was between 12 to 15 hours a day, a man would make $5 per week, while a woman would make $2 per week. And children, um, as young as 5 years old, would make $1 per week. While the hours were long and the work was difficult, many people sought these jobs as an escape from farms. So as they came towards the mills, cities would form around these industrial sites um, and would be filled with people. Mill jobs provided opportunities that did not exist prior to the Industrial Revolution. This caused the migration of thousands of people towards urban centers such as New York, Philadelphia, and in this case, in these pictures, Chicago. This urban growth was extremely rapid, and cities were ballooned by the hundreds of thousands of people, causing them to be put together in relatively haphazard fashions, um, and generally not planned as we would plan our cities today. This can be seen if you visit downtown areas of modern-day American cities, where the downtown areas will have small streets, that oftentimes are crammed uh, compared to the more suburban areas which have large planned streets. This growth is illustrated by looking at Chicago. In the 1820s, it was nothing but a Native American fishing village. By the 1850s, it was a large city. And by the 1896, it was what we would refer to as a megacity. 
This rapid population growth is something called urbanization. Urbanization is when people move to a certain center and essentially form cities. However, rapid ur urbanization can cause some significant problems, mainly something that we would refer to as squalor and disgust. Um, essentially, when you have a hundreds of thousands of people coming to a certain area, you cannot have time to create infrastructure for these people, and this will lead to terrible living conditions. Most people would be burning coal fires, which would lead to terrible pollution, um, essentially making the sky completely black. Um, with no sewers in place, well, you would have raw sewage in the streets with no place to go, and then you would have trash because you would have no trash collectors, and all of this would breed a disease, rodents, and other vermin that we do not like to live with. When you think about housing all of these people, well, you need to build the buildings as fast as you possibly can, and this leads to no building codes. And when you put all this, um, all these people in one place, well, essentially this causes a chaos where you have um, no law and order that is able to take care of them. All in all, most cities in the early 20th or 19th century were disgusting and dirty places to live. Meanwhile, one of the major goals um, nationally was to create an easier way to get from the country to the cities so farmers could have a market for their goods. One of the ways that this was accomplished was through canals. Canals are man-made waterways that connect a larger body of water with another body of water and they essentially act as a water superhighway. Hills are navigated by a series of locks which allow the water to rise and fall that will bring boats up and down the hills and this made transportation from the interior to the country to the cities significantly faster. The most famous canal was the Erie Canal built between 1817 and 1825. It connected Lake Erie with the Hudson River and subsequently with New York City. This allowed a uh, cities like Buffalo, New York to have a seaport in New York City. Because of this easy transportation, cities would spring up along the canal routes. So the Erie Canal, which was originally called Quinton's Big Ditch, named after the governor of New York at the time, was 363 miles long, 40 feet wide, 4 feet deep, and um, with 18 aqueducts and 83 locks to move up and down the hills. It would reduce the travel time between the Big Lake or the Great Lakes and the East Coast by up to 90%. Um, and it would prompt westward migration because you did not have to live in the cities. Cities such as Rochester turned into the nation's first boom towns, um, and New York City became the busiest port in the United States. Technology and innovation oftentimes go along with industrialization. Now, one of the most important inventors of the time was a man named Eli Whitney. Whitney's first invention was to create interchangeable parts for gun manufacturing. So, guns could be cheaply made, um, and if you broke a part, they could just buy a new part instead of having to fashion one customly. This idea of interchangeable parts could be seen with many, many inventions today, such as automobiles um, and essentially anything that we want to do mechanically. You don't have to fashion the part. You could just go to the store and buy a new part if a part breaks. Whitney's most important invention, however, was the cotton gin, a, a machine devised to take the seeds out of cotton quickly that would allow cotton to become profitable so it could be used in the new uh, factories of New England. However, the most important invention would be the telegraph, which would allow for almost instantaneous communication. These new inventions would allow Midwestern farms uh, to grow more food that would be sold in the Northeast and they would become more efficient. The Midwestern farmers would also become markets for the Northeastern manufactured goods because they were cheaper than making them at home. And the growth of the textile factories increased the demand for southern cotton, and especially since the cotton gin made that cotton easier to um, process, this would lead to an explosion in slavery in the South. Please summarize your notes explaining how industry grew in the United States and how it affected society. Um, use specific details from the lecture. Thank you very much, and we look forward to discussing this in class tomorrow.